Colossal Question. Who invented the Grim Reaper in the first place? The creepy character known as the Grim Reaper is usually depicted as a skeleton hidden beneath black ripped robes and a hood. He carries with him a scythe, a large knife-like tool used to cut down or reap grain, hence the name. No one can say for sure exactly when the Grim Reaper first started to appear in art and literature, but he seems to have first become popular across Europe in the 1300s, and for a particular reason, the plague. Also called the Black Death, the plague of the Middle Ages started in the mid-1300s and killed millions of people and remains one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. Needless to say, for the people living at the time, dying from a disease was a constant fear, so death loomed large in art, writing, religion, and everyday conversation. This was about the time that the Grim Reaper first became a popular character in art as a representation of death. Living through such a dark, dreadful, and depressing time meant that their artistic representation of death was about as dreary as possible. But if you look around at other cultures, their angels of death weren't always so, well, grim. For example, in many cultures, Death takes the form of perfectly pleasant people who are meant to ferry the dead from the realm of the living to the afterlife. In many of these stories, death might be stern, stoic, or sad, but they're usually much more helpful than frightening. But people weren't in a helpful or hopeful mood as the plague tore through Europe, hence the Grim Reaper. Whew. Okay, so that's how the Grim Reaper first became a popular personification of death in popular culture, but what's the story with his look? The look of the Grim Reaper is full of symbolism. The skeleton is pretty obvious. It represents our bones left behind after we die. The cloak matched the kind of simple black robes worn during funerals in those days. And the scythe? Well, it does a pretty good job of getting the idea across. A tool used for harvesting crops by swinging and cutting them down quickly and violently. The scythe symbolized death's ability to strike us down in large numbers. And with a plague in the streets, you can see why it made sense. So, next Halloween when you see someone walking around dressed like the Grim Reaper, at least you'll know why you're hardwired to be horrified by the sight of him. As you run away screaming! Could there ever actually be a zombie apocalypse? Let's start with some good news. No matter how popular zombies become in movies, TV shows, comics, and books, experts don't believe there's much of a chance we'll ever see a real-life zombie outbreak. There's never been a known virus that can cause the neurons in a brain to spark back to life and reanimate a brain that's already dead. What's dead is, well, dead. Now, in the animal kingdom, there is a real life fungal infection that looks and sounds an awful lot like zombification. It's called Orpheocordyceps, and it's a fungus that invades the body of an ant. Within a few days, the fungal infection completely takes over the poor little ant's body and forces it to climb up a tree or tall plant, cling onto a leaf, and then die. Creepy. The fungus then bursts out of the dead ant's head and releases spores into the air to start the cycle again. Super creepy. It's the closest thing to a real world zombie, but as weird as it is, undead ants with mushrooms in their heads aren't exactly brain eating monsters. But if somehow, in some fantasy future, there actually was an outbreak of the undead, well, what would happen? One study determined that hordes of zombies would whittle down Earth's population to just a few hundred survivors in only 100 days. It would take the first 20 days for a single zombie to start a small epidemic. From there, things would snowball fast. More and more people would get bitten every day, making more and more zombies, which would make it harder for humans to find anywhere safe to hide and leaving almost no one alive. There are two possible silver linings, though. First off, a zombie infection would be easy to contain since it's passed along by bite instead of the air or water. Secondly, humans wouldn't be alone in the fight. 
we'd have some allies. A slow zombie stumbling around an empty neighborhood would basically be free food for any scavenger, like a vulture, and a total feeding frenzy for all those fungi and insects that help dead things decompose. Plenty of zombies would be taken down by the Earth's unending ability to eat up and break down just about everything, even walking corpses. So, what would happen in a real-life zombie outbreak? Well, things would go bad. Really, really bad. But, lucky for us, zombies remain a fun bit of fiction rather than any kind of real concern. At least for now. Where did Halloween come from? Halloween dates all the way back to the ancient Celtic people who celebrated Samhain, one of their most important holidays, on mm. November 1st. Samhain marked the end of the harvest season and beginning of the cold, dark winter. In Celtic lore, the boundary between the living and the dead becomes blurred on the night before the new year, October 31st. Ghosts roam the earth, damage property, and cause all around havoc. The Celtic priests, called druids, built giant bonfires to combat the ghastly spirits. People would gather all around, wearing costumes made from animals, and would try to tell each other's fortune. Sounds a little familiar, right? Okay, so that's Halloween's origins, but when did it become Halloween as we know it today? Well, that started when the Romans invaded and eventually took control over the Celtic lands. In order to ease the transition to Roman rule, the Romans blended two of their own holidays with the old Celtic New Year traditions. One of the Roman holidays commemorated the dead, and the other celebrated the goddess of trees and fruit, and may have been the origin of bobbing for apples. This spooky blended holiday was forced to change once again when the Celtic Church established a festival called All Saints Day to be held every year on November 1st. The All Saints Day celebration was also called All Hallows or All Hallowmas, and the night before it, October 31st, the traditional night of Samhain began to be called All Hallows Eve and, over time, Halloween. When a wave of European immigrants came to the United States in the 1800s, they brought their hodgepodge Halloween holiday traditions with them. In the late 1800s, the U.S. tried to sanitize the holiday into a night of community gathering rather than a celebration of ghosts and ghouls. But clearly that didn't work, because by the turn of the 20th century, Halloween parties with costumes, games, and seasonal food quickly became the most popular way to celebrate Halloween. So over time, Halloween went from an ancient fall harvest festival to a day mostly about candy, costumes, tricks, treats, and spooky fun. Who invented jack-o'-lanterns? In the 1600s, the word jack-o'-lantern had nothing to do with carving pumpkins. Back then, the word meant a night watchman who carries a lantern with them. Over the next couple decades, jack-o'-lantern was used to describe creepy, mysterious lights that can materialize in bogs, marshes, and swamps. This phenomenon happens when gases bubble out of swampy waters and ignite when they come into contact with heat or electricity in the air. Today, we call these lights Will-o'-the-Wisp, but they've had many names throughout history. Jack-o'-lanterns, corpse candles, fairy lights, or foolish fire. Before we understood this chemical reaction, people told all sorts of stories to try and explain the lights. In Ireland, those stories were usually sung about a guy named Stingy Jack. According to the legend, Stingy Jack played a trick on the devil. As a punishment, he was banished from both heaven and hell, condemned to live in a never-ending night with only one source of light, a piece of coal burning inside a carved-out turnip. Sound familiar? In Ireland and Scotland, kids would carve creepy faces into vegetable lanterns and hide in the woods, scaring unsuspecting strangers. Over time, families started making their own jack's lanterns out of turnips, potatoes, or beets, and put them in their windows to scare away evil jack and other evil spirits. When immigrants from these countries came to the United States, they brought their seasonal jack-o'-lantern tradition with them. They quickly found that plump pumpkins, a common fruit in North America, made for the perfect jack-o'-lanterns. So how did pumpkin carving make the leap from local tradition to a must-have Halloween decoration? Well, some say it's all thanks to an 1892 Halloween party that was hosted by the mayor of Atlanta. 
The mayor's wife had several pumpkins carved with creepy faces and lit from within with candles placed all around the party. The spooky decorations were a smash success, and before you know it, jack-o'-lantern mania spread across the country. So rest easy this Halloween, because your jack-o'-lantern might just save you from Stingy Jack, if you believe in that kind of thing. Why do we go trick-or-treating on Halloween? Since at least medieval times, there's been a tradition of mumming on holidays like Christmas or Easter. Mumming is when you go door to door in costume, performing short skits or plays in exchange for food or drink. The mumming tradition likely spread to the Halloween season because of an old Celtic festival called Samhain. We talked about Samhain in our episode last week, if you want to know where Halloween itself came from. During the October 31st festival, Celts would dress up in spooky costumes and go door to door asking for treats. And if someone refused, well, they were cursed with bad luck for the entire winter. That sounds a lot like trick or treating, huh? By the 1500s, kids in Scotland would go door to door disguised in fancy costumes with masks or face paint. They would recite rhymes and threaten to cause mischief if they weren't given food. This was a tricky holiday tradition known as guising. Children in England had a similar tradition called soli. They would wear costumes, meet up in groups, and go from house to house, singing and asking for little cakes called soul cakes, apples, money, or anything the homeowner would give. By the 1890s, mumming, souling, or guising on Halloween was common in all British Isles. In fact, some mischief makers would even carry lanterns made out of scooped out vegetables. These lanterns were the predecessors of the modern jack-o'-lantern. If you want to know more about that, watch our episode all about where jack-o'-lanterns came from. We'll put a link at the end of the episode. The first reports of guising in North America wasn't until 1911 in Ontario, Canada. The term trick-or-treat was first used in 1927 by a newspaper in Alberta. Trick-or-treating first spread to the United States around the 1930s, and by the 1950s, it was a national tradition. This is partly thanks to a famous Peanuts comic strip from 1951 that showed Charlie Brown out trick-or-treating. By the mid-50s, trick-or-treating was firmly settled as an important part of the American Halloween tradition. Now, go eat some candy! Why do we have nightmares? Nightmares might be super unpleasant, but experts actually think they might have helped our ancestors to survive. Imagine for a second that you're a caveman and you know that if you aren't careful, a big, fierce, saber-toothed tiger is gonna take a swipe at you. Those caveman nightmares might have been scary, but they helped to keep their brain focused on potential dangers in the real world. That all makes sense for caveman times when danger was actually around every turn, but what about today? Are nightmares still useful in the safety of the modern world? Well, yes and no. Unlike in the ancient past, most people don't find themselves in constant danger, so the need for the nightmare mechanism might be minimal, but there are times it can still be useful today. More modern fears like bullies, rejection, or being made fun of can cause people the same kind of nightmares that physical fears did in the past. And just like in the past, those nightmares can help you find ways to deal with your fears. So that answers why we have nightmares, but is there anything we can do to stop them if they keep happening? Well, there are a few techniques out there, like rehearsing an end to your nightmare while you're awake so that your sleeping brain can finish it off in what's called a mastery dream. The idea is that if you can conquer the fear within your dream, it might help you deal with whatever is causing you the nightmares. And if you forget everything else from this episode, just try to remember one thing. It's only a dream. Why do we dress up in costumes on Halloween? Halloween costumes can actually trace their origins all the way back to the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. During the celebration, people would put on costumes or masks made from animals and gather around a bonfire. This festival is the ancient ancestor of Halloween, making the Celts the first known people to dress up for the holiday. So that's where the costume tradition got started, but it wasn't until the 16th century in Scotland that Halloween costumes started taking on their modern form. You see, the Scots had a Halloween tradition called guising, where kids would go door to door in disguises or costumes, doing party tricks in exchange for treats. Sound familiar? 
These Halloween traditions made their way to the United States with immigrants in the 1800s. And slowly, Halloween costumes started morphing again in America. At first, costumes in the US tended to have a Victorian Gothic style that we think of as classic Halloween today. They tended to be made at home using everyday items and fabrics. But by the 1930s, that started to shift. Big companies started manufacturing mass-produced Halloween costumes that parents could buy in the store. Lots of moms and dads jumped at the chance to buy a costume they didn't have to make themselves as trick-or-treating became more and more popular across the country. At first, the costumes you could buy were pretty basic. Witch, zombie, ghost, skeleton, vampire, and things like that. But over time, companies started making costumes for popular cartoon characters, superheroes, and pop culture icons. Costumes have only become more and more elaborate ever since. Now today, you can turn just about anything into a costume. 